Good morning, Good Shepherd. Uh, whether you're live streaming or whether you're live at our campus that's in Charlotte, North Carolina, I'm Talbot Davis, the pastor here. Always glad that you have connected with us. And uh, today is the, the wrap-up message in the series that's called Scripture and the Skeptic. Today, uh, over the last couple of weeks, because we, uh, last several weeks, because we realize there's, there's a lot of people in our lives. There's a lot of people we see when we look in the mirror who may have doubts about the Bible's truthfulness or reliability or even the messages that the scriptures contain. And and so we've just spent several weeks looking at that whole notion of scripture and the skeptic. And even last week, the third week of the series is, can we talk about Leviticus, which is an, to, to many of you would be an odd, strange book in the Old Testament. And we realized, ah, Leviticus is a love story and it really does show us that God knows what's good for us better than we do. And then today, as we wrap up the series, it's called, Is the Bible Racist? And to help us answer that question, if you have your Bible with you and and your Bible looks like this, you might want to locate the book of Acts, which is in the New Testament, Acts chapter 8 and verses 26 through 40. If your Bible isn't with you or it's loaded on your phone, you can scroll there uh, on your phone for the book of Acts. And we're also going to start briefly in the book of Genesis as well. But wherever you are, however you're encountering the scripture, We're going to have the words up on the screen, whether it's the live stream screen you're using or the the screen that's here in our worship center. So you'll be able to see the scripture for yourself. And all that stuff is really important to us at Good Shepherd Church because we believe a couple of things about the Bible. And some of you have heard this a lot and others of you have never heard it before. But we've just realized this is an an important thing that we repeat to ourselves week after week after week. And one of the the things that we believe about the Bible is that it is not a book. It is a library. A lot of authors written over a long span of time and in multiple writing styles. The book of Acts that we're going to be looking at is really kind of a, a travel narrative and an history book of the earliest, earliest years of the church just after Jesus died and rose again. You may not know this, but the book of Acts is also written by the Dr. Luke, who wrote the gospel of, yes, you're on it. And and so Acts is really volume two of of the gospel of Luke. And all that is just kind of a fact that a lot of people don't know. The, The other thing that we believe about the Bible, deeply held conviction here at this church that you may wrestle with, you may be a skeptical towards, or, or you may be like, yeah, thank you for believing that. But it's this, we, we, we believe that this library is unlike any other library on earth. God breathed his life into its words. He put his truth onto its pages. He worked with the personalities of the authors so that we could gaze on the person of Jesus. We believe that the Bible is inspired and eternal and true. And because of that conviction, we do something strange when we talk about the Bible at this church. We lift it up. And and again, you might not have ever tuned in before or been here before. And and you're like, that's odd, all those Bibles and phones and stuff in the air. And you know how we answer it? We admit it. Why try to deny it? It is odd. But we've discovered this is a moment of oddity that shapes our identity as a community. Amen. Amen. And before I say any other words, uh, I, I always, something else that happens every time we gather, I can't give a message without praying for it and about it beforehand. So uh, let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for the, the truth and beauty and wisdom and, and fascinating world that is your word. And I ask God that in, in these moments that you would fill me just with a fresh pouring out of truth and wisdom and insight. And as I pray these prayers, I celebrate the fact that I'm powerless without you, but because of you, I'm never helpless. In Jesus' name, amen. So many years ago, the Bible was stolen from us. And today, we're stealing it back. And you're like, huh? Yeah, the, the Bible was stolen really from its rightful owners and rightful users several hundred years ago. 
a group of people, mostly European in background and mostly on the sort of the wealthy scale of the human race. They looked at these old, old words from Genesis chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Have a look at the words that they looked at. Genesis chapter 9, when Woa, Noah, Woa, that was a great Bible character, that Woa guy. When Noah awoke, see, it's not that easy to say those two words together. When Noah done woke up, that's easier. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. And he also said, praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem, may Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend Japheth's territory. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Japheth. People looked at those words several hundred years ago and thought to themselves, well, it looks like there are still Canaanites among us. It looks like there's people still on the weaker end and economically among our world population and they tend to have darker skin. And so it looks like there's an endorsement of slavery right here in the Bible. I mean, it's in the Bible. And so these folks decided to undergird their racism and the chattel slavery, the slave trade that followed it in so many words by saying, well, it's literally in the Bible. So let's make these folks our literal slaves. It's called the curse of Ham. And I heard it as recently as the early 1990s in another part of the state of North Carolina as justification, reason for all kinds of prejudice, all kinds of racism, and yeah, even all kinds of slavery. It it seemed like a clear case. Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. (laughs) Except now we know it's much more accurately described as a case of Bible theft, which is why we need to steal it right back. And why would I call that understanding of Genesis chapter 9 Bible theft? Y'all are going to love this if you've been to Good Shepherd before. It all goes back to C-I-E. Context is everything. And the context of Genesis chapter 9 verses 24 through 27 might just be the most interesting context in the history of Bible context stuff. First of all, who said these words in Genesis chapter 9? Noah, not or Woa, if you want to call them that. Noah, not God. And when did Noah say these words? He said these words right after the rains stopped and the floods receded and the ark came to rest on Mount Ararat, unless it's also in Kentucky these days, right where the ark came to rest. And, and what, was going, what was the emotional and mental state of Noah when he said these words? Hung over? Yeah. When it says, when Noah awoke from his wine, he didn't wake up from a good night's sleep. He woke up from being passed out. See, for reasons that are completely beyond us, and this is in the Bible. Once the ark comes to rest on Mount Ararat to celebrate, I guess, Noah, go. I don't know if you know this because it's not in anybody's illustrated children's Bible of the Noah story, but when the ark comes to rest, Noah comes out, gets rip roaring drunk and buck naked. And he suffers some sort of indignity. We don't know exactly what the indignity is at the hands of his son, Ham. And so good shepherd, would, would you trust someone? Would you trust the wisdom? of uh, Some of you have woken up from your wine and you, you know you wouldn't trust your own wisdom. But would you trust the wisdom of, of someone who's woken up with a pounding headache and a dry mouth and he's looking for him for some, for some goodies, hangover powder to get through the, the rest of the day. And would, would you trust that man's wisdom on what he had to say about anything? Much less would would you let a man in that condition establish a pecking order for the human race for all? You might. I won't. 
And now we understand where these words actually come from and the state of mind in which they were uttered. Hopefully, we now can have that ability to address how the Bible was stolen from us because today we are stealing it back as we address that question, is the Bible racist? And face it, some of, some of you have heard that question may, maybe, maybe more over the last couple of years than at any other time in your life. And if, and if you're white, you, you, you felt sort of defensive about how to answer. You felt kind of powerless to answer it well. And, and if you're, you're black, sometimes you, you've wondered, if, and if you're a Christian, and sometimes you've wondered, well, should I even call myself that given the way the, 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 the Bible and the faith has been weaponized? If you're Asian, if you're Latino, and you're a Christian, you may even have some qualms about it all, considering the ways that you, you're, as your ancestors were evangelized, their lands were colonized. And so given all that uncertainty and all that experience and all that people have been through, wherever you are on, on the racial spectrum, it's really an unsettling, sort of disturbing question. Is the Bible racist? And, and for a lot of folks, for a lot of folks, we, kind of the, the default place to, to address that question, especially because of what people did with Genesis chapter 9, and especially because of the slave trade in, in the middle part, in the 1500s, uh, all the way through the 1800s. Not the only time slaves are traded in human history, just the one that the, has the most tortured experience in our land. But in all that, what, what, what's come to sort of be assumed is, is, is Christianity a white man's religion? It's interesting, that's the, the accusation that gets hurled a lot in India, where Good Shepherd, as you saw today, has a large presence, that, that Indian people will often ask one another, well, why would you want to convert from Hinduism, which is the de facto national religion of India? Why would you want to convert from Hinduism to Christianity, since all that is is just a, an American sort of white man's religion. Why would you want to do that? And, and, and kind of behind that question that people in India ask of one another is the realization that for centuries, the Christian faith and the Bible on, on which it's based has been the dominant one and first in Western Europe and then in North America. And it seems like the, the leadership of, of so much of the church world typically rests in, in, in the hands of Anglo men. And, and for, for some of you in the house and for some of you live streaming, it, it, it goes through your mind. Well, the, there, there we go again. There, there's just more dead white men having all kinds of influence on our world, whether it's the people who wrote the Declaration of Independence or, or the Constitution or the faces on Mount Rushmore. Th there they go again. It's just, it's just dead white men having all kinds of influence over people of all races and both genders. And both genders, stop, both. Gen and, and as I, but as I say that, all the dead white men, I, I realize, well, one of these days, I'm gonna be a dead white man. And so <laughs> some of you are like, sooner, please, but... So with all that, all that kind of assumption, you, you, a really good question to ask, well, how many, how many books of the Bible were written by white men? 66 books, at least 40 authors, written over a long span of time, as I tell you every time we gather together, multiple writing styles, and the Bible has so much influence on so many generations all around the world. Well, just how many of those biblical books, if the Bible's racist, how many of those biblical books were written by white men? And the answer, zip, zero, Nada, not a single white man in the bunch. In fact, virtually all of the authors of scripture are olive skinned. They were ancient Middle Easterners, maybe a North African and Arabian mixed in, but the vast majority Middle Easterners, olive skinned. In fact, if you were to see a, a biblical author, they would look a lot, look and dress a lot more like Afghan immigrants 
than they would like a, a prep schooler with Oxford cloth and penny loafers. That's just the look that they would have brought. And, and, and beyond the fact that not a single book in the Bible is written by the dreaded dead white guy, the story they tell, the narratives they craft is the opposite in, in every way, the polar opposite of racism. In, in all the ways that, that the world wants to stratify us apart, the, the world wants to tear us apart, the, the biblical authors come up with this remarkable, incredible narrative that seeks to reverse all of that. And, and of all the stories the biblical authors tell that, that, that do this dramatic reversal of the dividing that people love to do based on skin color and background and language. Maybe none is, the more, is more remarkable than the one we're gonna look at in Acts chapter eight. Remember, Acts is, is the early history book, the history book of the early church. It's a travel narrative and it is written by an olive-skinned doctor and journalist. He's both at the same time. He's both a medical doctor and a journalist named Luke. And the story that we're going to look at in, involves a, a, a disciple, a follower of Jesus named Philip, another olive skin guy, and a man from Ethiopia, which is in Northeast Africa. And so clearly, obviously, he's, he's darker than the olive skin people in the story. So we're looking at a story without a white person in the bunch. And there's something else about the man from Ethiopia in this story. Take a look at Acts chapter eight, verses 26 and 27, as, as Luke, olive skinned Luke, opens up the story. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And so he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. And the man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Now that's really sad, sad stuff there. When it says he's a eunuch, that means when, when this man was eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, he was subjected to the most brutal of surgeries without anesthesia, without sterile equipment. And it rendered him sexless, the surgery that he went through as an eight-year-old boy. And the result on his physical being, physical bearing was that he had a high neck and he had a, a long neck and a high pitched voice. And obviously he was no comp because the king of Ethiopia at the time had ordered this surgery done on this man. And obviously he could become, he would be no competition for the ladies in the king's court. That's why they did this unspeakable thing to eight year old boys. And so here, this man has been rejected his entire life because he's not quite a man and he's not quite a woman. He's kind of in between. And he's always at the victim, the, the, the mercy of other people. And when Philip comes across him, he hears him reading. Such an interesting detail in the Bible. He hears the man reading in his high-pitched, pretty feminine voice because of what's been taken from him. I mean, if we, we talk about the Bible has been stolen from us, this man's identity had been stolen from him. And the reason that Philip, Philip hears him reading from Isaiah is because that's the only way that people read in those days. People did not read silently. That's a much more recent development. In, in, in the way humans have grown. He, to read in those days was to read out loud. So Philip hears this man in his high-pitched voice reading from Isaiah. Look what happens in verses 30 and 31. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man, now you know why it says heard, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip said? How can I, he said, verse 31, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So in a chariot next to, as, and as a good Jew, this is what Philip, how he was raised, he should not be in the same presence as a eunuch, much less sitting by him, much less explaining scripture to him. And that lets you know that Jesus is already doing something in Philip that has to do with breaking down all the barriers that human beings create. And launching from the book of Isaiah, look at how Philip explains the good news of Jesus. 
This is the passage of scripture that the eunuch was reading. And if you don't know, which is fine, Isaiah was written about 700 years before Jesus ever appeared on earth. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. That's the end of the Isaiah quote. And the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet? Who's Isaiah talking about? Himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And so launching into there, can can you imagine as Philip told this eunuch, this man used to rejection, used to not fitting into any categories. Can you imagine how he must have identified with the savior about whom he was hearing? Here's a man, Jesus, who like him had no children. A man, Jesus, who like him was rejected by the people who should have loved him the, the most. This man, Jesus, who like him had been reviled and and rebuked and and ultimately killed simply because of who he was. And so at every level, this Ethiopian eunuch hearing about a Jewish Messiah must have been like, that that offers me hope. And it all built to this question that I love in verse verse 36. As, As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, Philip, here's water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? Hey, Philip, will you Christians, will will you treat me like everyone else has and keep me at an arm's length or will you welcome me in? Hey, Philip, will, will, will you Christians, will you be as good as your word and your savior will be my savior as well? Hey, Philip, Philip, can I be in your inner circle or are you, are you gonna regard me as sort of an attraction in a freak show? Or will you regard me as someone beloved by God? Which will you do? And I love Philip's answer because it doesn't have any words. Philip dunks him into his answer. Look at what it says in verse 38. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. And then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. And I I love that. He, He doesn't give an answer. He dunks an answer. And when Philip does this, notice he, he didn't have to bring this man's baptism before a committee. He didn't have to write a position paper. Do we baptize eunuchs? Do we baptize people from Ethiopia? He, he, didn't, he didn't have to bring it up before the denomination. He didn't have to do any of that. Why? Because he knew his savior. And he knew that what the world stratifies, the scripture unifies, that, that what the world tears apart, Jesus brings back together. He, Philip knew, but even, even before we in 2022 knew, the Bible's been stolen. We're stealing it back. And that, that man, when, when he gets baptized, I don't know if you know this, as, as Eric Huffman tells us, he, he becomes the first African, the first eunuch, one of the very first Gentiles and most likely the very first black person to become a Christian. And, and from that launches this incredible explosion of the Christian faith into what we call today the global South. And, and when it comes to, to this guy, this Ethiopian eunuch, always rejected, now embraced, always scorned and now loved, always an outsider and now a complete drenched insider. That's not the end of his story in Acts chapter eight because look over at Acts chapter 13 and verse one where we see this. Now, this is, this is probably 10, 15 years later in the history of the early church and Luke, Dr. Luke, olive skin, Luke, Now in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And look at that character, Simeon 
called Najir. The way we describe the descriptors we use are a little bit different these days than they were in, in, in New Testament days. But Najir, which is today a land in Africa, it's a country in Africa. There's a country called Najir. And, and in New Testament times, that was a way of referring to Simeon, the, the guy with the darker complexion. You got Saul, you got Barnabas, you got all those olive skin people. And just so you know, Simeon from the, this Simeon from the other Simeon, this is Simeon, the darker one is how he was described. And the early church leaders, they almost universally recognized, ah, the Ethiopian in Acts chapter eight is the same guy as Simeon called Najir in Acts chapter 13. Now named, now not only dunked into community, but serving as a leader and as a teacher as a living example of the fact that not only is the Bible not racist, but the Savior who breathed life and truth into the Bible, he is all about taking what the world stratifies and bringing great, great unity into it. And I don't know if you know this or not, but from from that one man, Simeon called Najir, an Ethiopian eunuch, I don't know if you know this or not, there are now more Christians in Africa than there are people in the United States. In fact, experts uh, estimate that by the year 2025, that there will be 633 million Christians on the African continent. And they all trace their spiritual ancestry to this doubly rejected Ethiopian eunuch who asks, can I be baptized? And Philip doesn't have to speak an answer. He can dunk an answer because Philip knows his savior. And the great news is about all the 630 million Christians on the African continent is, is that a good chunk of them have come to, hello, Southwest Charlotte to settle. And that we at Good Shepherd, we have people who trace their own ancestry to Ethiopia who are part of our community. And one of them is a man named Zerahun Hailu. He's one of my good friends at this church. And we want you, I got something I'm going to say afterwards, but we want you to meet Zerahun. So take a look up on the screen, see what he's about. My name is Zerahun Hailu, and me and my family attend Good Shepherd Church. I came to faith in Christ when I was in high school in Ethiopia. The story of Jesus, that gospel story attracts me a lot. So I just kept reading the New Testament. And I found myself like, you know, oh, I'm a follower of Christ. Coming to faith in Christ in Ethiopia during that time, is there is so many things which makes it unique. Ethiopia being multi-ethnic, more than 80 ethnic groups. Once we come to Christ, the unique thing is we are one in Christ. It don't matter whether you are from these ethnic groups, that ethnic groups. He is my brother, she is my sister. And instead of you know fighting, uh, we come to unity. We start coming to Good Shepherd Church the Christmas of 2018. In Ethiopia, Regardless of your ethnic groups, because you follow Jesus Christ, we just celebrate Christ together. When I see people coming to Good Shepherd Church, whether they are white, black, or Latinos together, that reminds me what it looks like in heaven. John 1.12 is always in my heart because anybody regardless who he is, what background, when he believes in the name of Jesus and accept him as his personal savior, God will adopt him, accept him, embrace him as his own child. That's always amazes me, whether you are white, black, Latino, uh, African, European descent, or Asian descent, when you believe in Jesus Christ and when you accept his redemptive work, God always accepts you as his own child.
racist Bible couldn't be more wrong. Wall-busting Savior, more like it. And, and can, I, can I tell y'all one more thing? We, we Americans, whether you're black or white or Asian or Latino, if, if you're American, we so need Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. Take a look at Revelation 7 verse 9. What's happening in heaven in glory right now and what will happen for all of eternity. And look at what it says. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Every nation, tribe, and tongue. And we, what, we Americans, we, we, we hear race, we hear ethnic, ethnicity, and we think automatically, black, white, it's where it stops. And to a large degree, we do that because that's our own tortured story, the one in a lot of ways we're tr still trying to figure out. But know this, God is not an American. God is bigger than that. God is not only global, God is galactic. And when he gives us this picture of Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9, it's not just black and white. It is everyone from all tribes and all colors and all cultures. We need to, we get to have this God perspective on the racial question. Because when we get there and what's going on in heaven right now, it's not monochromatic, all one color, and it's not duochromatic. It's not just about getting two different races all together. It's the whole Kodachrome, give us the nice bright colors together. And the greatest thing perhaps in Revelation 7, 9, as it tells us, is that, that ethnicity for, for eternity, ethnicity, does not disappear. Asians will still be Asian and Latinos will still be Latino and blacks will still be black and whites will still be white. Not a hint of shame or embarrassment among any of them. Instead, this incredible appreciation for the savior who the world has tried to tear apart and we're bringing them back together. And the world has stolen the Bible from us. And today, we joyfully steal it right back. Let's pray. God, thank you. You're, you're bigger than all of us. Bigger than every division and every faction. And Lord, thank you that even though the blood inside us may divide, the blood applied to us unites. And I pray that you would pour out that hallelujah on everyone bought with the same divine, perfect blood of Jesus today. In your name we pray. Amen.